actually did these calculations. We have in Canada vast areas of what are called insufficiently restocked forests. Okay? These are forests that have never been replanted adequately, but which, if they were planted, would be, uh, could become major carbon sinks. Now, if we invested in a massive national reforestation program, it would only take about 20 or 30 percent of our insufficiently restocked forest lands. I, I think I'm remembering these numbers correctly. Uh, which, by the time the trees were 10 or 15 years old, would absorb the entire carbon output of normal life in Canada. Not the tar sands operation, but driving our cars and heating our homes and so on and so forth. We have a sufficiently large carbon sink to neutralize our own output. And in the meantime, we would be providing the future basis of a forest industry. We would be providing the ecosystems necessary to sustain biodiversity. We would be providing the forests necessary for much better water management. We'd be providing et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the benefits of this alternative are, are spinning off all over the place. We'd have a new industry called ecosystems management companies emerging in every major uh, former forest product uh, community in the country that, that have now cleaned out the forest and walked away from it. You see them getting at There are alternatives to the way we organize our economy that can spread the benefits, create employment, they may not be as high paying jobs as the stockbroker on Wall Street, but that raises a whole other question. I, here's your homework assignment. Write this down. Go home and get a copy of The Spirit Level. Okay? So it's a little book that shows with exquisite data that those countries which have relatively lower incomes than say Canada, the United States, but small income disparity, in other words, not very large gaps between rich and poor, are much happier countries by every indicator of uh, population health and well-being than are rich countries with big income gaps. Now, why is that significant? It's significant for reasons that Jenny showed earlier. We have seen in the past 40 years in North America an enormous increase in the income gap. In the last 20 years, I've read that 80% of the increase in national income in the United States has gone to the top 1% of income earners. If you look in Canada, a recent Stats Canada report compares the, the quintiles of Canadian population in terms of their um, net worth. If we look at the poorest quintile of Canadians in the last uh, 20 years, I guess it is, they have now got negative net worth. So they used to have positive net worth, they've now got negative net worth. In other words, if they liquidated everything, they'd still owe money. The top 20% have gained 80% in net worth over that same period of time. So we see an inordinate increase in the gap between rich and poor, which leads to deteriorating population health in every dimension. Guess which country in the OECD has a steadily falling uh, longevity right now? United States, okay? If you look at countries with minimal income gaps, um, the Northern European countries in Japan, they're right at the top in terms of performance on all of these indicators. So we've got to think carefully about what it is to get rich. Who is rich? A country that has low drug addiction, low alcoholism, high rates of family survival, and so on and so forth, but say moderate incomes, or a rich country with great income disparity Riven by drug addictions, a high murder rate, uh, you know, on and on and on and on. Well, you can define wealth any way you like. I prefer to live in the first country rather than the second country. But we are rapidly, as a matter of public policy, creating the second country. Income disparity, uh, chronic poverty, uh, uh, increasing despair among low-income peoples, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I know I should shut up. I won't say another word. All <laughs> no, no. Just to to get um, to the uh, answer in Vancouver, I think that uh, one of the things, if if you're really going to live without fossil fuels, a it'd be pretty hard. But you you already know the answer, right? It's live locally, be a local vor. Local transportation options, try to live your life within the small radius that you can. Every time you're using any kind of fossil-based activity or fossil-based product, you're, you're depending on oil. So if you're trying to imagine what the economy is going to look like without that oil, you know, you can start at trying to imagine what products could you substitute for the ones that you're using that are high energy intensity. And that's understanding the life cycle and also being very active in community economic development strategies that are supporting your local economies and, and really being intentional about 
lowering your own lifestyle threshold. So that's part of it. And the other part of it is getting very politically involved in supporting local leaders who are trying to lead this, whether they're business entrepreneurs or elected politicians, or you're going to be part of electing those politicians who are standing up for the kinds of values that you want. So. <laughs> I lied. I am going to say a couple more things. How do you feel about Canada and particularly British Columbia, and particularly Vancouver, becoming a major exporter of climate change, which will visit ecological damage, death, and destruction on millions of people around the world as a matter of deliberate public policy. Remember I said we are a species capable of moral judgments. This is a moral question now, and we have to ask ourselves whether we want to be in that position because that's exactly the position we're being put in by our senior governments. And the next question, I think, was there, there, and then there. So we're going to go. Question? Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the reasons why we have to keep on growing is because we need to expand the tax base to pay for the maintenance of all the infrastructure. And I, I'm very behind a lot of how do you imagine we're going to make that turnaround in a non-turbulent way? Who's your question for? Uh, <laughs> I take it first for one minute, yeah. and then we'll <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, so it, it is a real dilemma. I think one of the things that we've found in, in urban um, development is that we have severely underestimated the true cost of maintaining our infrastructure over long periods of time. One of the things in Vancouver is we've overinvested in oversizing a lot of our infrastructure, and it's a sunk capital cost that we need to, to recover. And so for the first uh, 100 years of Vancouver's history, we actually gave people a discount if they used more. So the more water you use, the more energy you use, the more discounted your rate was. And then we finally realized, okay, we are kind of bumping up against these limits. The watershed's only got so much water and more people are here, more demand. So now we flip that around, we actually charge a penalty. So the more electricity you consume, the water, more water you consume, the more you pay. But we haven't reached a, a place yet where we have severed the short-term economic stimulus that comes from urban development against the long-term infrastructure crisis that we're facing in municipalities right across the country, including in the Vancouver and Metro Vancouver, around maintaining our infrastructure. So we are lucky here. We have adopted a 100-year cycle for infrastructure maintenance. But as Bill has pointed out, that assumes that we will have fossil fuels to produce concrete and all the other things that we're going to maintain. And we're not so sure that those costs are going to remain stable over the long term. So taxes may be going up to support an ever-increasing debt burden on infrastructure maintenance. And at some point, new development won't even make sense in the short term. But the economics right now are still driving us in an unsustainable way. So hopefully that touches a little bit on your question. There's really two dimensions to this question. The, the first thing we have to realize that the larger something becomes, the more of the net energy flows has to go into simple maintenance, right? And that's what Jenny's talking about. The, the city gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but now stuff is 50 years old and it starts to wear out and you have to replace it. The point is, something that's very big uses a huge quantity of energy and material just to maintain itself in place so that it doesn't erode any further. That's without growth. And if you are in a system that has a limited rate of production of new inputs, you will reach the point eventually where the scale of the system uses all of the inputs simply to maintain itself. There's no further surpluses for growth, okay? So there's no net benefit in, in growing beyond that point. The second thing is it's a bit of a myth that we need constant growth uh, to raise the funds to, to do any of this stuff. If you go back to the Eisenhower era in the United States and a similar era in Canada, the marginal tax rate, that is to say the income tax paid by very wealthy people, uh, was 91%. Today it's 37% in the United States and something similar in Canada is actually lower. So we've reached the point in which the, the, uh, the tax system is biased against the maintenance of, of public infrastructure. It, the burden is increasingly being put on poor and middle class people while the rich get a free ride, which is you know, exactly why we're seeing such a cutback in our public service, in infrastructure payments, our education system. We're being told increasingly we can't afford our education. 
this country has never been richer. How come we cannot afford decent public education? I grew up in Toronto in the 1950s in a middle class, working class neighborhood. I went to Downsview Collegiate Institute, look it up. In my high school, we had shop, uh, orchestra, band, household economics, French, Latin, Greece, or Greek, Greek, French, Latin, <laughs> Greek, Spanish, and German as alternative languages in addition to English, and you had to take any three of the above. Today, none of that exists because we can't afford it. And that was when the economy was less than half, well, something like a third of the current scale. But we taxed people more equitably because back in those days, taxation was recognized as the means by which people of moderate means pooled their assets to achieve something of common purpose. You see, today taxes are evil. We've changed the, the, the nature of our political discourse so that governments are inefficient, taxes are evil, there's no such thing as community, and by the way, every, you know, as individuals to change your habits so that we can become sustainable, as if corporations and governments have no responsibility whatsoever in this. Okay, folks, we all know the most instantaneous way of fixing the climate change issue is fair prices on carbon, a carbon tax of significant scale that changes the nature of the economy by letting prices tell the truth about the real costs of goods and services. Well, you can't... That requires a collective response, government intervention in the economy on behalf of the common good. Sustainability is a collective problem that you cannot solve as an individual. You cannot create in the city of Vancouver the decent transit system we need. As an individual, try it sometime. <laughs> you cannot do it. It has to be done by our government on our behalf because it's the right thing to do in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So we need to revert the political discourse to recognizing that we are in community, that we live together, that we require each other for mutual support, and the rich who are getting a free ride on everything out of this have got to start paying their due in, in the maintenance of our culture and society. So, so we're now at the uh, speed portion of the question round. We've only got two questions left, so if everybody could speak, there, uh, we'll even see if we can squeeze it in a little quicker. Uh, so just. Bill, this is the speed run. Can you do it? Our next question is over here. Okay. Um, I can direct it to the first speaker. Um, I don't uh, question the information that you brought forth. I came late, but I heard it. So I didn't question it. Now, I'm going to have a possibility of questioning the climate change um, uh, terminology or the or the uh, of what it is is that um, so I don't question environmentalism I don't question what you brought forth now what I'm going to say is that you basically just sort of added on the concept of climate change and I haven't made up my mind whether I believe in the theory or not I believe it in, in environmentalism but there's also a uh, uh, a thought, if you look at certain of, 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 of these YouTube postings, and in 2007, br br British um, do docu um, uh, British do do documentary. Okay, I know this, but wait a minute. What I'm going to say is that you you simply tagged on climate change. It, it, it seems to me. I mean, what proof do you have that this is not a false dichotomy? That and there's actually a, a person. Okay, well, uh, okay. De 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 Dennis, De Dennis Rancourt, who used to teach physics at at Ottawa, University of Ottawa. He um, has questioned it. He has come. He calls himself a self-described anarchist. He comes from a left-wing perspective. His thing is that they this is a way of actually denial of true environmental problems whole climate change thing. Um, well, well, how, why are you convinced of climate change theory? So I'm going to ask with this. So the question is, why? 
Why am I convinced of, of climate change theory? First of all, the basic science has been known since the early and mid part of the 19th century and has been tested experimentally over and over again. Now there's no question, there are many, many, many influences on the climate of the planet Earth. And we know what most of them are through studies in what are called paleoclimatology, the uh, various influences on past climates. Of course the Earth's temperature and ice ages have fluctuated often throughout history, and we know the mechanisms that cause those things to happen, okay? No question about that. But what we also know are the fundamental drivers of the heat uh, exchange between the Earth and the rest of the universe. We know that if the Earth retains more heat than it loses, the temperature will rise. We know that if the Earth loses more heat than it's gaining, the temperature will fall. That's just simple, it's addition and subtraction. And what human beings have done uniquely is in a course of a very few decades, 150 years or so, increase one of the major heat retaining gases. It just reflects infrared radiation back, re-radiates it back to the surface. We've increased it by 40% in the atmosphere in the course of time. There are several predictions going back nearly 100 years as to what the effect of such an increase would be. And so far, the system has responded precisely according to the predictions of those science. Now, I know the gentleman you're talking about. There's a dozen other prominent climate skeptics, and it doesn't matter what the IPCC or anyone else says, they'll come out with some counter explanation. The problem is this, that of all the known causes of temperature fluctuations on the planet, only one is changing in the direction in which we are observing real world temperatures and heat retention changing. And that's the greenhouse gas composition caused by human activities on the planet. Many of these other causes would have an effect, but they don't happen to be in operation right now. So it's very strong circumstantial evidence that is totally consistent with known theory to suggest why we're seeing what we're seeing, a 50 fold increase in extreme weather events is not statistically probable in any model unless there's a cause that we can put a finger on. It's not possible to have 12 of the 14 hottest years all occurring in the last 13 years without something uh, pushing that in a direction uh, that results in those kinds of outcomes. And the only known factor that we can put a finger on that does that is the rise in, in anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Keep in mind, too, that we can even explain. I showed that curve where the temperature isn't increasing steadily. It, for 20 years, it may be absolutely flat. But we know why that's the case in terms of the uh, uh, decadal oscillation patterns in the oceans where the cold North Pacific assimilates so much heat that it, it doesn't accumulate in the atmosphere. But it's still accumulating in the oceans. And now we've got uh, that network of instruments that shows the heat retention of the planet is, as I said, what was it, 400,000 uh, Hiroshima-type bombs every single day of, of the year. That's an inordinate increase, and we can find but one explanation for it. Science and scientists are trained to be skeptical. The nature of science is skepticism. And believe me, if anyone could demonstrate that there was some other cause at work here, they'd win a Nobel Prize. And believe me, every climate scientist who's studying these phenomena would love to find that option if it were a real option. But they haven't found it. That's why I'm I've convinced of, of the reality of climate change. So we're in the speed uh, question series of the end. I'd like to move the next question a little more back. I think we've got space for, is that one or two, uh, fearless leader, Justin? Questions, one or two? Ooh, two questions. Okay, we'll go there and then we'll go to the back. Your question is? Oh, and could you speak really, really fastly like this? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I recently read a book that talked about how humans, what we have always done as human bus. It's called Dirt Erosion of Civilization by Robert Arthur Fountain. That this boom and bus has all we've ever done, and now we're doing it on planet Earth. And it's scale. So my question is, what are the chances that um, we will be forced to change by something like the end of fossil fuels? That's exactly what I'm saying. We have the choice. We, we can let the planet go through. We can let the human system go through the same cycle that Joseph Tainter and others have observed over and over again. Or 
knowing that that has happened, knowing that this seems to be a pattern that is built into the human system, we have the intelligence, we have the capacity to change that should we choose to do so. But you see, you guys all have to wake up sufficiently to vote the right way. Okay, You've got to become politically engaged. We need to recapture this ground so that our politicians are making decisions for our benefit, not for the benefit of, of, of corporate interests. So you're absolutely right. It is a cycle. Biologists call it the panarchy cycle. It happens in every system in nature. They go through cyclical phenomenology. Human societies are no different, but we know about it, we know the mechanisms, and we have at least, therefore, the potential to change the circumstances so it doesn't happen again. Because you're right. It used to be that societies collapsed regionally. You know, Mesopotamia goes down, the Roman Empire goes down, the Incas collapse. Well, today, hey, thanks to globalization, wasn't that a great idea? Now we all go down together. <laughs> okay, and now we're down to the final last question, which goes to the back. The city is rolling out a food scraps uh, recovery program and Metro Vancouver is going to be banning um, organics in the waste stream uh, in 2015, I believe. It's coming very soon. So you are going to see uh, us slowly catching up, but uh, your point just illustrates that while we're moving towards uh, these steps, and, and don't forget that uh, it's the food that you're putting in scraps, presumably you've eaten it in some way, but what we really also need to do is only buy what we're actually going to consume. So it is coming, but um, yeah, we're not leaders in everything. I gather we're getting close to the end in the evening. Listen, I don't want this to be a bummer. This isn't a downer, okay? This is a, an awakening. I want you also to keep in mind, we may be wrong, you know? The world is full of surprises, very complex system. Some great technological development may occur to pull us all out of this. But that's not the way I want to act. I want to act on what I know now and what is likely to happen. All right? And that's all I'm saying. What we know is sufficient to act in ways that can change the course of our own history should we choose to do so. And by the way, even if, what was it, what if we made a, made a better world and that we didn't need to? Is that this? What a waste. What a waste. I mean, good grief. So, look, we may be wrong. This analysis may be completely wrong. Maybe your climate skeptics know something that nobody else knows about. Highly improbable. I'm not, I'm not in, I'm not in, okay. Oh, no, but that, 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 yeah, yeah, let's not make a big issue of it. The point of the matter is we well, have enough action now. We have enough knowledge now to act sensibly, consistently with our own best analyses in ways that apply our intelligence to changing the future in ways that would be desirable. Ain't that a nice way to end the evening? Let's do it. Let's just get out there and do it. So I'd like to give a round of applause to our two panelists and also a round of applause for Justin at the back who came up for the concept and has been working fearlessly to make a video which you will be able to watch online for the mere sum of free. Uh, this event was organized by Vancouver Degrowth and the Extra Environmentalists. We're now doing events twice a month. Uh, everybody on the, who has signed up will get our propaganda. And if you'd like to make a donation so that we can afford beer at some point in the next year, we have a little bowl over there. All donations are welcome, especially beer. Oh, oh um, and one last thing. Any donation above $10, there's a book. It's really great. The author is brilliant. If you make a donation above $10, please grab a book. And the next question, last question of the evening is, are the PowerPoints available for people? Okay, go away. <laughs>